This is the Ross Developers Podcast, episode 53. The Ross Developers Podcast, the Ross Developers. The Ross Developers Podcast, the Ross Developers. Hello, Ross Developers. Today, we are going to learn a little bit about the history of ROS. So many of you are asking us, how that is ROS started? And how has been the evolution from this starting point until the current situation of today? So this is very interesting information that we are going to share here with you. So let's go for it. And let me tell you that everything started with those two guys. Keenan Weidelbeck and Eric Berger, while they were at Stanford doing their uh, career. So when they were doing this uh, research on robotics, they found that the people at the different labs around the world, and many, many research labs around the world, they were taking a lot of time re-implementing the wheel, taking a lot of time to implement the infrastructure for the robot itself and very, very little time about actually building the, the real programs that they wanted to build. Let's say, for example, for machine learning. So they wanted the robot to recognize some objects. So the amount of time, as you can see in this slide, in different labs around the world is most of it, let's say 90% of the time is re-implementing all this infrastructure all the uh, drivers for, for the different elements, and just a little bit, a 10%, implementing what they actually wanted to build. That's, those are the algorithms for robotics. What do I mean by implementing infrastructure? So implementing infrastructure means uh, basically building drivers for the different actuators of the robot and the sensors. Let's say this uh, specific uh, LiDAR, there's a specific gripper, then you change on that robot the LiDAR, you need to build another driver, for example. So a lot of time was creating those drivers and maintaining them. Another thing, it was about building the inter-process communication between different programs in a robot. Because as you probably know, when we program for a robot, it's a little bit different where, as when we program to a computer like this one. is in, in a robot, you have many programs and those programs, they have to talk to each other, transferring information from one of those. So there was no actual uh, standard intercommunication, interprocess communication between different modules inside the robot. So every lab was building its own, let's say, and that's a lot of work, a lot of maintenance, so a, a pain. So let me show you an example of the problems that we had at that time. So those guys that were suffering. You had a robotics program, Let's say it's a SLAM program, and then you want to connect this for that. You need uh, data from a laser, from a LiDAR, and then you buy this one of Hokuyo. But at some point in time, this Hokuyo is not no longer available, or maybe it's too expensive for your uh, robot, and then you decide to change to another one from, exam for example, a sick robot, uh, LiDAR, LiDAR. Then what happens is at that point in time, this robotics program it couldn't talk to the laser, so somebody else has to dedicate time in order to create a new driver for the new laser. And that was happening all the time. Uh, also, another problem with this situation is that if, imagine that you have this uh, UR5 robot there, and then you, you create a program to make the UR5 work. Uh, then you change uh, to another ARM robot of the same style, same same features, let's say, but from another brand, and then your robotics program doesn't work on that new robot. So those are the situations that were facing the robotics at that time. And those two guys decided to change. So for that, they created what they call the Stanford Personal Robotics Program. What does it... Uh, it's about this program. So basically it was to build a programming framework for process communication, allow to share code between robots, and also allow to share code between devices. And then 
uh, that was the first part of their program and the second part is to build 10 robots so the idea is, is very cool it's very cool because they they decided okay we are going to build this framework for robotics that we think that is going to improve the quality of our software and the way the, uh, that we create programs for robots and then what are we going to do to push people to create the, this framework okay so let's create 10 robots so we create 10 robots uh, that are complex enough and we provide those to the universities and then we provide this for free so the universities are going to create programs using our framework that's a very cool idea and that's what they did so they created in 2007 they, they created the personal robot one what is called the pr1 that you can see on the on the picture that's very cool and that they created only one version of this and then at that point in time it was 2008 they saw that okay the idea was very good but in order to progress they needed to uh, find some more money some more collaborators to uh, in, enlarge their team so they started to look for investors in order to increase the team that develops this framework that at that point in time it still didn't have any name okay so i i put there ross but it was no name and then at that point in time in 2008 uh, those two guys they found scott hassan scott uh, was the founder of um, a startup that is called Willow Garage and they were developing there some stuff for robotics uh, different things but when they pitched to Scott Hassan then Scott uh, clearly identified that as a very good opportunity for the uh, creation for the uh, improvement of robotics so he decided to invest into that project and he took that uh, framework that's the development of this system within Willow Garage and actually it was so successful that some time later the next year then scott decided that willow garage was going to be only dedicated to the development of ross only to that so in 2008 ross as we know it was uh, born ross as the robot operating system and it, the main development of ross was was being done in the uh, Willow Garage. Then in 2009, after some months of work, they released the first version of ROS, that the 04 that was called Mango Tango. Very funny name, yes? I don't know where it comes from. And that was the version 04, okay? So that's the first official release of ROS. And also on that year, they launched the PR2, that's the personal robot version 2. So they created a second version of the original robot following the same plan that they had at the beginning about building some extra robots for universities and making them create programs for that. So they started by rebuilding completely the PR1 and creating a new version, the PR2, that all of you, if you are Ross lovers, you you must know about the PR2 and it's very likely that you have been using it in many experiments even if in simulation only but that's okay that's an amazing robot and for the time it was impressive so then the next year 2009 they created they launched the version 1 of ROS actually it was the second one I mean the version 1.0 the, the one that is not in beta state and they started to call this version as the after the names of the turtles of different types of turtles so in this case in 2010 they, they launched the Ross Box Turtle and how does it work these names these funny names that you can see in the different distributions of Ross well uh, it's following the so every version of Ross has a name after a type of after a kind of turtle okay so that's the first thing that you need to know then uh, based on the number of the distribution then they select a type of turtle which name corresponds to the 
number of the letter of the of the letter of the first letter of the name of the robot that corresponds if we use the abecedary so for example in this case ROS 1.0 is the second version of ROS okay so that means that if we follow the abecedary is A B B second okay so then they look for a name of a turtle a, a, a type of a turtle that starts with a B in this case is box so they named Ross box turtle then the third version how should it be what do you think is a third letter so it's a B C so it has to be a turtle that starts with C let's see which one it is but we are going to wait for a little bit because on that day on that year on 2010 yet they achieve to uh, build 11 PR2 robots. 11. Okay, so basically at that point in time, they have already achieved the original goal that uh, Keenan and uh, Eric, they started at the beginning. So they have, uh, at this point in time, they have created 11 PR2 robots and provided to the universities along the world in order for the universities to create software for that robot. And then later on that year, then the third version of ROS, and that's it, C Turtle. Okay, C Turtle. It looks like there is a, a, a name for a, a turtle type, a turtle type that is called C Turtle. So actually, uh, I don't know. I don't know. They, they should have a book like this with all the names of the different kinds of turtles. I don't know. Well, in 2010, that's when I started to get in contact with RAW. So that's the first version, C Turtle, the one that I started personally to work while I was working at this company, it's called Power Robotics, and we were doing some humanoid robots. We were using their ROS for controlling those robots. So that's when I started. It was a huge improvement in our code because it was a nightmare you know here you can see three different robots and poof, to maintain the software for each one of those and for each type of sensor whenever everything is broke is broken then we have to substitute and change the code again wow that was crazy so that was a, a huge improvement there so uh, yeah we use it for example for this another humanoid that is called the rim robot for grasping things. Um, then in 2010, Ross launched what it's called the Ross Answers. The Ross Answers is a, it's a, like a forum. You know, it's a forum where people can go and ask questions related to their doubts, to the problems with the programming in Ross. That's a huge, huge uh, help for all the developers, all the Ross developers around the world because Whenever you have a problem, you can go there and then get some help. Remember that Ross was very in a very early stage and just a few people knew about it. So that was a very good idea in order to concentrate all the people that know about Ross in a single place and help each other. And also in, in this 2010, you can see these uh, statistics that were published by Willow Garage themselves. And you can see how the number of repositories and packages is growing exponentially along the years since the first uh, launch in 2007. Then we reached 2011. At that point, a new distribution, Ross Diamondback. Very, very cool. I remember that one, like the one that I have used one of the most. Really like uh, this one. And it's also in 2011 that uh, the Aguilo uh, Garage, they decided to integrate the Gazebo Simulator as the official simulator of ROS. You know, the Gazebo Simulator probably is a 3D simulator. That means that it represents an environment in 3D and also contains the physics of the elements and that was also very helpful at that time because you can simulate your robots in that simulator and test your programs before you are putting your programs into your robot into your real robot and that is helping you a lot in order to develop faster and find some strange errors that can make your robot crash so you are preventing your robot from crashing 
and from doing stupid things around if you test before in the simulator. That was in 2011. Then another version in 2011, Electric Ames. I love this image, it's super cool. For me, it's the best image of all the best logo of all the uh, the Ross uh, distributions that ever seen. Love it. So that was 2011. And then another important point in the development of Ross, the Tartarbot robot. So that was developed mainly by Melanie Weiss and Tully Foot, two guys that were they're working at Willow Garage. And this robot, what is interesting is that by building this robot, they were providing to the Ross community with a robot that was not expensive at all. So remember that if you wanted to program with ROS, then you need to have a, a robot that is ROSified. That was, it's complex. So if you build your robot from, from scratch, then that was complex. So people need to have a robot to practice ROS before trying to ROSify their own robot. And then at that point, the, the only option was to buy a PR2 that is hundreds of thousands of uh, dollars. That's a lot of money. But what about if we can create a robot that it's only for 2000 and everybody can get one. It's a small one. It can make navigation. It can make uh, person detection. It can do many things in, in ROS. And it's uh, affordable in terms of price. That was a tartable robot. A lot of people, they have bought this and also uh, of universities for their students because it was affordable. Super cool idea. Then we moved to 2012, ROS Fuerte, another version of ROS. In 2012, also we got the first ROS Con. ROS Con is the official ROS conference. It's a worldwide conference that it's held every year. Actually, last year was uh, here in Madrid, in Spain. Uh, and we are based in Barcelona, but uh, here uh, in Spain also. So that was in Madrid, last one. You can see here a list of the different um, Ross conference that have been held uh, around the, the world in the different years. And by the way, this year is in Macau, in uh, China. So if you are willing to be there, then I, I hope that you have the chance to go there, uh, buy the tickets early because they get ex exhausted very quickly and uh, we'll see you, we'll see each other there. So I hope that I, I meet you there. Then 2012, still another version, Ross Groovy Galapagos. So uh, this one, which number is? So it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, seventh, seven version, G, Groovy Galapagos. Uh, very funny picture, <laughs> very funny picture. And then it reaches 2013 and something very strange happened. Willow Garage closes its doors. Wow. Wow. So, so I remember, I remember that time because I was still working at Robotics, and we had changed all our software in our robots to ROS. So all the humanoid robots that we were building there, they were running in ROS. And then we received this new about Willow Garage closing. So everybody was like, wow, what? What is going to happen now? Are we going to start again, to have to start again and uh, find another framework or for programming our robots? So what are we going to do? But fortunately, uh, from the death of Willow Garage, it was the birth of the Open Source Robotics Foundation. So that was the foundation that was created by some of the members of the original Willow Garage in order to keep the ROS environment, ROS, all the ROS products, ROS and also Gazebo and some other code, that to keep it alive and to keep pushing in, in order to to not to make the raw system die. That was super cool. That was 2013. So they will keep pushing and in 2000, still in 2013, a new version of ROS was released, ROS Hydro Medusa. 
2014, another version, Ross Indigo Igloo, also another one that I have used a lot, a lot. So uh, uh, many companies also I know that they have been using this. Even I think that even today some companies are using Indigo still. Uh, it's a, a distribution from 2014, okay, so already five years old. But very, very good distribution. Then Hade Torto. Mm, somebody does somebody remember this version i don't know i don't know i think that very little uh, lo very little people uh, use it that was 2015 and then uh, then in 2015 also the osrf they started to develop a new version of ROS that they would call ROS 2 so it's not a new distribution but a new version so they decided they, they were getting a lot of feedback from the people, especially from the industry, that they were reluctant to use ROS into their industrial products. They were using a lot of ROS for uh, prototyping, but not for the final production um, ready product. And some of the reasons because lack of real time, lack of security, lack of um, uh, having a single central point for failure and also not possible to embed into a small microprocessors etc many many reasons so the osrf got all this feedback and decided to build a new version of ROS from scratch and that this new version will be addressing this uh, uh, will be addressing this uh, th those concerns that the industry was having so that's 2015 when the they first started to develop the first version of ROS2, still not published, okay? Then we reached 2015 and then we got Kinetic came, 16, sorry, 2016, and we got Kinetic came. And that's the one that is being used by at present by many, many, many people, many companies, also many researchers. Kinetic is quite a standard, even if the next version has been ready for a couple of years there. But then after uh, Kinetic, it came Lunar loggerhead it's in 2017 and then it, at that point in time uh, the osrf they changed the name from open source robotics foundation into open robotics and that's how we know this company at present and they changed from foundation to uh, an actual company in order to to be able to accept some projects that will make um kind of, of profit so as being a foundation i think I, I don't understand very well the situation of that but basically is that as a foundation they cannot generate any profit and in this so some projects were not uh, possible for them to do it and then they decided to change into a company also still developing ROS, but uh, they they are allowed to generate money from that company and then 2017, the first version of ROS2 was released following the same type of naming after turtles in, uh, in ROS. That's called Arden Apollon. I would like to see that book that they have about the names of the turtles and how do they select that. That would be interesting. Then 2018, then the, the latest melodic uh, the latest ROS version that we have is called melodic morenia and uh, this is quite interesting because this is the latest the one that we have now so if you go to download the the latest long-term support distribution then that's it melodic morenia you should download that one and it's interesting also because this distribution is the last one that is using python 2 for their for the you know working so ROS one working in Python two has been working since the very beginning but at this point in time the next one after melodic Morena Morena is going not to be using Python two it's going to be based on Python three then uh, we reach by the uh, 2018 and, and then we got the newest version of ROS two Bouncy Bolson and uh, also on the same year at the last month of the same year that was in december some months ago 
uh, so we got another version of ROS2 that was the Crystal Clemmings. Actually, that's the one that I have started to, to read and to learn about ROS2 by using this one. And then just a month ago, uh, in July, in July, yes, July of 2019, then we got Dashing Diamata. That's the latest ROS2 version that we got. And then it is a schedule that for the 2020, we are going to have the newest version of ROS. So it's going to be also a long-term support of ROS1, and it's called ROS Noetic. So what happened with ROS Noetic? ROS Noetic is very, very special uh, because several things. First, there has been no, no long-term support between melodic and noetic so it's been like uh, the open robotics have decided that only they are going to publish from from melodic they are going to publish only long-term support versions so not in the middle of a non-long-term support so the next one is going to be also a long-term support ross noetic then second thing is that it's based on python 3 so that's very cool because python 2 is is dead already so we better switch to Python 3. And third, it is the plans at present are that uh, it's going to be the last ROS 1 version that we are going to have. So from 2020, we are not going to have more ROS 1 uh, distributions in there. So that's the last one. Then we have reached the end of the history of ROS because we have reached a current state. And then the question is if will ROS become for robots what Windows is for computers or what Android is for phones? So what do you think? What do you think? Let me know on the comments below this video. Let me know if you think that is going to achieve it or not. The, th the only thing that I can tell you is that many companies around the world building ROS based robots and here you have some of them and different types real robots manipulators humanoids etc so i don't know so that's all that i know about the history of ROS actually i didn't call it the history of ROS because maybe i have some mistakes that's based on my own experience in the field so that's why i call a history of ROS and that's all for today guys so uh, please let me know what you think on the comments below do you think that ROS is going to conquer the world or it's going to be something something else developed by another company maybe one of the bigger companies like Google or Nvidia some of them that they are going to generate their own framework and they are going to conquer all the robots of the world I don't know we can see only that uh, ROS has a bright future and that all the numbers, all the stats for ROS are going up. So I sincerely bet for ROS and I think that it's going to be the, the one that rules the world of the robots, of course. So thank you very much for your time and see you around here with other stories about ROS. Bye bye. The Ross Developers Podcast. The Ross Developers.